Okay, here we have a rough picture of the ribs of our chest wall, and obviously these ribs are connected um, together by the external intercostals and the internal intercostals. Um, now I want to point out that, you know, I've sort of purposely drawn these um, ribs in a shape that is not round, because that is correct for our ribs. They have more of a oval type shape. And when the external intercostals pull them up, the ribs tend to turn um, upward and outward. So they're going to tend to turn up and out. And that is going to expand the lungs. So if you can picture it, so I'm going to make a picture here of it after it expands up and out. And that pulls, if you can sort of picture it in your mind, if this happens in all of our ribs, as they get pulled up and out, it's going to cause the entire chest wall to move outward. Now the other part of our chest wall is the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is this domed um, muscle that extends across the top of our, our abdomen, as everyone's aware of. And again, when, um, when the diaphragm is relaxed, then it's you know sort of way up in this position. And when it contracts, then it flattens out because of the shortening of the muscle fibers, right? So the shorter this, the muscle fibers in this dome are, um, the straighter the diaphragm is going to be. So as the diaphragm, the muscles in the diaphragm contract, it's going to move down from this relaxed dome structure to a more flattened structure, and that also is going to expand the chest wall outwards. Okay, so what do we have on the inside here? Well, um, up against the the chest wall here, the tissues right around the, the ribs, is the parietal pleura. And the parietal pleura meets at the hilum of the lungs. Now remember the hilum is that collection right um, sort of in the center of each lung where all the central airways and vasculature meet. Now the parietal pleura is continuous with the, so the parietal pleura is the outer layer that goes against the chest wall, and it's continuous. That means, you know, these, these layers are all one piece. They connect together at the hilum, and the inner layer is called the visceral pleura. And there is a potential space in between them. There is um, usually there connected together by a very thin layer of fluid, and that fluid is called the pleural fluid. And there is about a teaspoon and a half of pleural fluid um, on each side of the lungs. Okay, so about 7.5 mLs of pleural fluid, and it's just enough to coat the, um, the entire surface of the pleura with a sort of very, very thin layer of moisture. And that moisture um, provides um, surface tension that holds the two layers of the pleura together, but still allows them to slide back and forth on each other. Okay, now on the inside of the visceral layer of the pleura is the lung tissue. And the lung tissue is, of course, made up of alveoli um, and airways and all the vasculature within the lungs. So we're going to have little alveoli here that connect to small airways, that connect to other small airways, and eventually work their way up to a main bronchus and then out through the trachea, and through the oropharynx, and out to the air, right? So, interestingly, um, 
I wanted to talk about some pressures. So if we start out here at end expiration, so the diaphragm now is nice and relaxed. And I'm going to erase this, the um, other potential diaphragm, and all the um, intercostal muscles are relaxed as well. Then I wanted to talk about sort of the general state of the lungs and the pleura at this moment in time. So the alveoli um, actually always have a little bit of surface tension between the surfaces of the alveoli because in each alveolus there is a very thin coating of fluid. and this fluid is mostly made up of water and remember water being polar molecules wants to connect with another water mo molecule and if you don't um, if you don't remember why this happens please go back and review my um, earlier slides uh, from the first module where I talk about um, how um, water a polar molecule of water is attracted to to itself. Now, this at this microscopic level within an alveoli, this is a very po powerful force. So, in fact, if this force was not counteracted in some way, the alveoli would collapse, and no, there would there would be no muscle in our body strong enough to open it back up again. So, this f force is attenuated significantly by chemical called surfactant. And surfactant is a phospholipid molecule that is bound to a small protein. And this surfactant is um, actually kind of creates a layer on t sort of floats on top of the surface of the water and it significantly decreases the force of the water being attracted to to it. Now why is that? Well, let's take a closer look at the surface. So typically water molecules are going to be strongly attracted towards each other. But Surfactant, having um, being primarily made up of phospholipids, is ac actually each phospholipid has a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end. Now the hydrophilic end, when this when these molecules coat the surface of the water in alveoli, the hydrophilic end is going to bind with um, via a hydrogen bond to the water molecules, whereas the hydrophobic end will be repelled, so the little feet of these phospholipid molecules are going to be sticking out in the air. So what happens is, when this coats the surface, the, water, um, the hydrophobic ends are sort of repelling all the other hydrophobic ends, and this counteracts the force of the water molecules being pulled towards each other. So this force is sort of attenuated by, um, by the uh, layer of the surfactant molecules with the hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends. Now it doesn't totally counteract this effect, it just, it, but it significantly reduces it by about tenfold. Okay, so some surface tension does remain though, and this tends to want to make the alveoli collapse. And if you add up all the alveoli throughout our lungs, um, this causes the lungs to try to collapse and provides an uh, inward pressure in the lungs. Now also, at the same time, our lungs are made up with large, with um, connective tissue, and some of the connective tissue is collagen, but a lot of the connective tissue within the lung is elastin fibers. 
And these elastin fibers are sort of these proteins that, um, you know, collagen is generally straight and long and elastin fibers are sort of this wavy shape. And when you stretch them out, um, when you stretch them out, then they are always trying to return to their former shorter state. Um, and that provides an inward pull as well. So we have surface tension providing an inward pull and trying to make the lungs collapse and forces from the all the elastin fibers in the connective tissue of the lungs trying to pull these lungs in to collapse. Now <clears throat> generally if the lungs are healthy if um, the pleura is intact the lungs cannot collapse because they are being held in place by uh, the two layers of the pleura. So this sort of potential space within the pleura always has a negative pressure because the lungs are always pulling inwards on it and the chest wall is semi-rigid so it's not going to get pulled in so um, so the pleura are sort of in between two forces where the lung is trying to collapse and the chest wall is trying to remain semi-rigid so there is a constant negative pressure in the pleural space and at rest it's about 1.5 millimeters of mercury or about 10, 5 to 10 centimeters of water. These are both units of measurement uh, for um, pressure. Okay, so I want to talk about what happens now when we start to take a breath. Okay, so I'm going to move down a slide here and we'll draw our chest wall. And obviously we have ribs in here. And we have the diaphragm. Actually, I should make that more domed because we're still in a relaxed state. Okay, nice and domed. Okay, so what happens when um, it is time for us to inspire? Here, let me draw the lungs here on the inside, and you're just going to have to imagine that the pleura is in between the lungs and the chest wall, as we talked about. Um, now, on inspiration, there is going to be a large force. Here, let me increase my br brush size here. There's going to be a large force here and on the chest wall tending to pull the uh, chest wall outwards and at the same time there are going to be some smaller forces on the inside here with um, surface tension trying to pull the alve alveoli together and causing the lungs to recoil and a little bit from the last end of the lungs but if you add all these up the average from the force of the muscles expanding the lungs are going to win out the pleural space is going to become less negative and we are going to pull air in um, into the lungs Now on expiration, we have the chest wall here with the lungs on the inside and the airway. And we have the diaphragm now is starting out flat and then it relaxes. And, and increases in a, a domed shape. So what happens here is we have the chest wall re relaxing, although there's always some recoil, though the chest wall sort of re resists relaxing, so there is a slight force 
keeping it pushing outwards. Um, and even that's even true with the diaphragm. As the diaphragm relaxes, there's some inertia that keeps it from re, um, returning to its state. But the forces of recoil from inside the lung overwhelm the sort of forces from inertia on the outside. And there is a sort of normal expiration. Now, with forced expiration, this is just a, um, a relaxed expiration, right? So there's no muscles involved in the expiration usually. Usually we are just relaxing the muscles of our chest wall and our diaphragm. However, we can, we do also have the ability to have a forced expiration. And the forced expiration um, actually uses the intra-abdominal muscles to sort of um, push abdominal contents up against the diaphragm and provides a force up this way. And we also have the internal intercostal muscles that are pour, pulling the ribs down, I mean, uh, yes, down and inwards. And this provides an uh, inward push as well. Um, and then we still have the recoil of the lungs. And so this just makes the, um, if you add all these pressures up, it's going to result in a higher pressure um, leaving the airways. So during the major point I want you to get here is that during a normal expiration, our chest, the muscles in our diaphragm and chest wall are, um, are relaxed and the recoil of our chest wall is actually working against the expiration. The expiration occurs only because of the negative inward pressure that's caused by the recoil of the lung because of the elastin fibers and the, sur the surface tension inside the alveoli.